I think you'll, you'll see that this is a fantastic opportunity to connect with the students. Um, so the way this is going to work is the first half hour are going to be questions from the three panelists. And then after that, we're going to open the floor up for students and the audience to ask their own questions. So I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Kevin Spear, and I'm president of the Graduate Student Senate. My name is Jill Jones, and I'm vice president of the Panhellenic Council. And I'm Chuck Becker. I am also IFC's uh, vice president for programming. So we'll start this out easily. Um, throw me a softball. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Rachel Benish, uh, an English graduate student, wanted to know what your dream job was at the age of 12. <laughs> I actually have thought about that. And I, truly, I can't remember. I think I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. I did not at 12 think I wanted to be a university president, I can tell you that. <laughs> and okay. I used to get asked, when I was at Ohio State, I used to get asked all the time, well, did you always want to be provost? <laughs> no, I didn't even know what a provost was before, <laughs> before I became a faculty member. Okay. So I think my ambition at 12 was to be a teacher. All right. And I succeeded. Yes, good. Yep. Um, what new initiatives are you hoping to bring to CASE? I think the, the two things that I'm working on now, uh, one is the plan for financial recovery. You know that we've had a deficit the last uh, few years and we can't continue that way. And we are planning to present that to our board of trustees in October and we'll be talking more with all of you about that too. Uh, and the second thing is a strategic academic plan for the university. We need to have something that, that is, a, is a roadmap for our future that will identify what our priorities are short and long term, will identify the action steps that we'll take to get there, identify the offices and people responsible for the different elements, uh, include an articulation of the metrics we will use to measure our progress, and include some benchmark institutions so that we can compare ourselves to some of our peers. So we need to get that done, and we are going to get that done by the end of the academic year. And we'll be working with lots of people. There will be lots of focus groups, so you all will have an opportunity to participate in that. Our interim provost, Jerry Goldberg, our longtime dean of dentistry, is leading that effort. Thank you. So along that note, and, and more of long-term goals, where do you see the school in five to ten years? I hope to be able to say in really a, a few years, but five to ten is a good is a good time period that we truly are among the handful of outstanding urban research universities in the United States, and I think many of you know the the group I I aspire for us to be in. Um, so, what do you plan to do as president of Case Western Reserve University? To emphasize the outreach, the social, and the economic impact of CASE um, in Ohio and Cleveland as well as even in the nation. One of the things I think we have to be careful about is not over-promising what we can deliver. We are not going to cure the economic ills of Cleveland or Northeast Ohio all by ourselves as CASE Western Reserve. We, we just don't have the capacity to do that. But we do have the capacity working with a number of partners to be able to have a very positive impact, and we already have done that. In fact, what, what we produce here at Case Western Reserve is extraordinarily well-prepared students who go out and contribute to the economy and to society in a variety of ways, and also, of course, research that, that makes a difference. And those, are our, those really are the things that we do and that we do really well. And that intellectual capital that I think we help to develop here at Case Western Reserve really is the key to a great economy. Those regions of the country that have done the best attract new businesses, not with the kinds of tax incentives that we used to see, but really with a, an extremely well-prepared workforce. And that means a lot more college graduates in this area than we currently have, and a lot more people prepared at the master's and doctoral level. That was a compliment, by the way, those of you didn't notice. Thank you. Next question. Case's national rankings have been falling in the past few years. Is there any plan of action for this? Part of our, of our plan will be to address that, although I don't want to overemphasize the rankings. I also don't want to ignore them because prospective students read them. Many of you probably bought the U.S. News 
best colleges and universities book before you decided to come here. And those of you who are in graduate or professional programs probably made some attempt to learn about how Case Western Reserve's program in whatever area you were considering stacks up against other peers. So I think it's important to acknowledge that those are out there and that they do influence students. Uh, the most important thing that we can do, though, is to be an outstanding research university focused on teaching students and at every level. And if we do that really well, I think the reputation will follow. Thank you. Um, as OSU provost, uh, part of your, your job entailed working with students that had been appointed to the board of trustees for Ohio State University. Um, do you see any, uh, any, any plans with maybe having some students uh, appointed to work with the board of trustees? We do have student leaders who, who help with committees. In fact, we had students on the presidential search committee, mm -hmm. uh, which was chaired, chaired by uh, the board chair and co-chaired by another trustee. So I think we have had a good history of that. The student trustees on the Ohio State Board are non-voting members of the board, uh, and that is a statutory decision. So public university trustees are, uh, the decision about, about appointment is made by the governor, but the number and the categories of trustees are set by the legislature. Um, a French student of ours, hopefully I can say his last name correctly, otherwise he'll kill me, Olivier Anou is in macromolecular science and engineering. And he wanted me to ask, um, when talking with companies, entrepreneurs, prospective students, and Case faculty, it seems that Case Western Reserve University does not have its own identity um, or its own uniqueness that would make Case recognized and known as a key reference in the academic world. What identity would you like to give to this university so that we can become a leading and empowering university with a recognizable identity? I guess I disagree with the premise because I do think we are well known and I think our alumni all over the country and really all over the world who have had tremendous success in a huge variety of disciplines are a testament to that. And they go out, as you all will, and help make our reputation for us in the most important way and in a way that, that all the money spent on PR in the world can't, can't buy for you. So it really is the work that, that our former students do out in the world that makes our reputation. And I think that it is very strong. I think it could be stronger. And I think that some of our issues rather recently have, have been around our, our recent past history, including the efforts and the discussion about our name and, and our logo and those kinds of things. But I think we've got all of that uh, headed in a very good direction. The most important element, though, of our reputation really is in our people and our students and our faculty and, of course, our staff. So I think when you go out and you get a job at a company and you work out to be, be a tremendous success and people say, didn't you get your graduate degree at Case Western Reserve University? And you say, yes, that's what makes our reputation. So really all of you are our ambassadors as all of our current alumni are now. Okay, thank you. Do you believe that the alumni are pleased with Case's rebranding? If not, what will be done to regain their support? I think they are pleased with it, and I have talked to Dr. Eastwood about this, who really led the effort last year. I did ask him if anybody had been clamoring for the return of the fat surfer. <laughs> he said no. Uh, and I hope all of you like the, the new logo. I know a lot of students last year, if you were on campus, did, did vote uh, when, when that was made available to you. So we are excited that we got such a, such a tremendous participation from alumni and from students, current members of the university community. Uh, but in a, in a way, that's really not the most important issue. The most important issue is really knowing who we are, and so that relates back to Kevin's question and, and what we want to be as, as an institution. And I think, again, we want to be among the handful of great urban research universities known for the students we produce. Thank you. Um, Jose Gomez, a graduate student in pharmacology, wanted to ask how Case Western Reserve University can influence making changes in immigration laws that regulate foreign students coming here for graduate, student, for graduate school. 
we've actually been working on that, not as a single institution, but as a part of a couple of national organizations. And we join with them and work collectively because we think it's a much better way to lobby Congress on that. And I think it really is important. We continue to believe that we need to have the best students from all over the world. And we want United States policy to help us do that. We're not the only university interested in doing that. And in the higher education world, we face some tough competition, especially in the post 9-11 days when, when competitor universities from other parts of the world were able to offer much easier access to international students. And we saw, as you all know, a decline in our international student population. Nationally, that is on the, the, the uh, rise, and we think that's a good thing. But we need to continue to work not only to change immigration policy to make it easier for students and faculty to come here because they contribute so much to our intellectual community. But also, we need to do more recruiting internationally as well. And that, again, is something that we're going to do as part of a, a consortium of institutions. It's pretty expensive to recruit internationally. And we think we can do it effectively by partnering with some other schools where we have some shared interests and can be promoting our programs. Uh, a lot of our, of our international recruitment is for students in graduate and professional programs, as you may know. I, I would follow up the statistic that since 2002, 30% of the graduate and professional student body is international. Mm -hmm. so, Chuck? And it's going to be really important for right. now and for the future. Okay. Um, I, I know uh, a third of the campus are involved with uh, fraternities or sororities, and looking around the room, it seems to be uh, about that, if not higher. Um, one of the parts of the master plan um, has been to have a, a Greek village um, and, and new Greek housing. Uh, that's been promised since I was a freshman. Um, what steps are being taken to, to fill that promise to the students on campus? I think we need to get our financial house in order before we really um, are able to deliver on those promises. So uh, that, that really is, is number one. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things it's important not to do, again, is promise more than we can deliver. And I think we, we have not given up on that. I think we do want to do it. We know that our Greek community is very important here, and we want it to continue to thrive. And we recognize that, that good facilities are a part of that. And if you need an example, there's really none better than the, the North Residential Village in general and the Village at 115 specifically. And high quality facilities and especially high quality housing contribute a huge amount to the life of the campus and to the student experience here. And we want our Greek students to have that experience as well. So I think we, we first need to get our financial house in order and then need to move forward on our plans. We have not given up on our master plan. Yes, we have delayed some capital things because we, we wanted to pull back and make sure we didn't overspend uh, or overcommit even worse. Uh, a somewhat related question. Um, Rachel Volokhov in psychology wanted me to ask, um, the, the new apartment style dorms at 115 are fantastic, but will the university ever really pursue um, similar graduate student housing? I hope that we will pursue graduate student housing because I think it's important. It, depending on who you talk to, some people believe that graduate students prefer not to live on campus. And I think we need to really work with our graduate students to assess the, the number who would be seriously interested because what we don't want to do is build in and assume they will come. We need to really work with the students and have a very good um, a preliminary study done so that we know that the interest really is there. We also need to look at the kinds of housing that would be most attractive. I assume it would be the kind of apartment style living that we have at the Village at 115 that would be most attractive. And then think about the kinds of things that we can do to make it really special for graduate students so that it wouldn't be just a duplication of the Village at 115, but would be something designed to meet the needs of, needs of graduate and professional students in particular. More beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> um, you had mentioned earlier that you're looking to benchmark off of other institutions. What institutions do you have in mind? We've developed a preliminary list of institutions, but we're still in the process of talking about that as part of the process of developing a strategic plan. 
but we're looking at places similar to us, not in every way, but in, in some big way. So we look at the confluence of disciplines. Is there a medical school? Is there an engineering school? Is there a business school? Is there a law school? Um, all the places we're looking at, of course, would have a strong arts and sciences core. Um, but other things they will have some of, but not, not all of. And so those are some of the things. Do they have more graduate and professional students than undergraduate students? We do. And what's the size of the undergraduate student population? What's the size of the graduate and professional population? Is it located in an urban environment or is it in a small college town? So I think we're interested in trying to identify some universities that are somewhat similar to us that are in some cases would be what we call aspirational peers to benchmark against so that we, we really get the best practices from places that are doing some things very well and from which we can learn. Okay, thank you. This, this one's a little bit heated. Um, you may be aware that 90% of American Association of Universities, uh, these institutions provide partial or complete coverage of graduate student health fees with an average coverage of 95%. And that our institution has the distinction of being one of only three universities on this list not to provide any coverage. What can the GSS do in conjunction with your office and all others that would need to be involved to implement graduate student health care coverage similar to and competitive with that of our peer institutions, even if it means starting small in light of the current university's financial situation. Yeah, I, this is something I believe in, something I worked on at Ohio State. I will tell you that, that by the time I left, we had moved to an 80% subsidy of health care benefits for GAs, and that was exactly the same as was provided for employees of the university which we thought was a good benchmark. One of the things I would caution everyone about is in looking at those numbers. Sometimes they do provide 100% of a plan that, that doesn't cover a lot. And so I think it's important to look both at the percentage of the cost that's covered and what the healthcare benefits actually are. Because you can provide 100% of a plan that doesn't provide a lot of benefits for graduate students, and I'm not sure that that really helps. So we have to be careful to make sure that it is truly a high quality plan and that we're subsidizing a high percentage of it in order to be competitive. I don't know whether it has to be at 100%, but I think it has to be at a very high percent in order to be competitive. And I think that's something we'll have to work at and I appreciate the way the question was framed because I think we will be able to make progress. And when we did this at Ohio State, over the four years that I was provost, we started at one place and kept moving and building on that until we got to the 80% level. And it really was a matter of being competitive because that's part of GA compensation. And in order to attract the best graduate students, that's part of the thing they will be assessing. So we have, to, we have to take a hard look at that. So I think the way we can work together is that the Graduate Student Senate and the administration can, can work on a, a strategy, a plan that will be phased in over time uh, that will achieve, I think, the goals that we share, and that is to have a very competitive environment to attract the best students. Thank you. Uh, so you've been on campus now f since January, I think? Well, February? I've been off and on on campus right. since January, but I actually started July 1st. All right. Well, since, you, since your time on campus, uh, what's been your favorite thing about the campus? Uh, I, I really, I was here before. I really love being mm -hmm. back. I'll tell you what the most pleasant surprise has been. Uh, before I came, I heard a lot of comments that led me to believe that morale might be quite low here um, because of recent past history. But actually, I've been really pleasantly surprised. That's not the case. I think students and faculty and staff and alumni actually have been very welcoming to me, to my family, and I think excited about the possibilities that are in front of us. We have some challenges, but those are all opportunities, too. And I think it's up to us to make the most of them. But I have been really, really pleased with the level of commitment to our university from all of our stakeholders. OK. Well, that's all the questions that we've got, right? I think so. Are we yeah. not on time? Yeah. I so. Yeah, so, so I guess we'd like to open the floor if any of you have any questions. Yeah. So just test. test. Hi. Uh, Hi. First of all, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a junior in civil engineering, uh, so as a result, I'm looking at uh, different graduate schools because uh, that's something I always wanted to do. 
Um, and currently, according to U.S. News and World Report, and I know some people don't put a lot of stock in this, and, and some do, uh, but in cor according to this report, um, Case's graduate school for engineering is ranked 45, whereas other schools, such as OSU, um, is actually ranked, um, I think, 20-something, like 25. Um, so my question is, and I know this is kind of a tough question, what reasons would you give me to stay here at Case for graduate school uh, in engineering? The most important reason to pick any graduate program is the faculty with whom you will work, and I think that, that truly should drive decision making. But I also think it's important to be part of a community, and I think that you, you should select based on where you think you're going to get a really outstanding experience, and that's a complete package, not just the academic experience, although that should be hugely important to somebody considering a graduate program, but also the quality of life that you will have as a graduate student. So I think we have a lot to offer in that way. I, it depends, of course, on which part of engineering you're interested in. You can look at the, we have different rankings in different programs. Uh, you're mentioning the sort of overall ranking for, for graduate programs in engineering, but US News actually does break out program specifically and relatively soon here we will see the rankings done by the National Research Council which is part of the National Academies and they also rank graduate programs and that will that will come out reasonably soon and you'll have that to look at as well other questions that you will want to ask as you're evaluating graduate schools have to do with placement of graduates and if that placement data show that you will likely end up a place where you want to go. I don't mean geographically, but I mean professionally, career-wise. And I think we have a great track record of placing our graduates in outstanding professional positions and that that should be important to you. I hope that you felt a real sense of community while you've been here as an undergraduate student and that that is important to you as well. Thank you. Do we have another question? Um, my name is Matthew Gardner. I'm an accounting student here. Uh, you already discussed what you were pleasantly surprised with finding when you got here, but what's the biggest change that you've encountered since when you were last here in the 80s that has uh, posed the biggest challenge to you, or what's the biggest change other than the fact that you're now president? <laughs> well, uh, there, there have been a number of changes. The look of the campus has changed in some ways, not in others. And I always think that I know where I'm going, and then things look a little different. Even, even my own law school, the, the uh, Peter B. Lewis building wasn't there when I was here the last time, so it <laughs> changed, changed the look of things and has changed my orientation to getting around. So there have been the additions to the campus, including, as I mentioned, the Lewis building, the library, others, a lot, just a number of physical changes. Uh, some things have actually stayed the same, though, and I don't want to ignore those. Um, one of the great things that I think stayed the same is the sense of community that I felt here when I was here the last time and that I really valued here. University Circle has become, if anything, an even more um, a potent partnership for the university and continues to be a great asset. I loved being part of University Circle when I was here and took advantage of some of the institutions as I hope you're doing. But there are even more opportunities to do that now. Um, great things like the Case Concert where we have one of our, one of our former um, students, a, a graduate of this university whose family foundation supports the Case Concert. I hope a lot of you went to that in the spring where you have an opportunity to go hear the Cleveland Orchestra right down the street for very little money thanks to the generosity of this foundation. So there are just a lot of things that are different. Um, clearly the challenges that we face that, that were not there when I was here the last time have to do with, with both the financial and I think the, the reputational challenges because of, because of our past history recently. Uh, we've had one or two presidents lately, and I think that, that presents a challenge that wasn't here when I was here the last time. Thank you. I would ask that you, the questioner, please give his or her name and affiliation before the question. Uh, I'm Nick Barbuto. I'm the president of the Residence Hall Association, and my question kind of goes in a different direction. Uh, every year I go to conferences around the country with other schools, and I hear stories about what, what their administration and their presidents do. And one that always struck me was, uh, and I've heard the story from a number of different schools, where the president actually comes into the dining hall and sits down with, with residents randomly uh, and enjoys, enjoys meals. So my question to you is, are you on the meal plan? 
<laughs> I am not Nick, but I should be, because my, my husband has always done most of the cooking for our family, and he is still in Columbus except on the weekends. So I go hungry a lot of the weekdays. <laughs> so actually, I should get on the meal plan, because I, I, for the part of the summer, I had one of my uh, children up here with me, and we went out to eat every night at one of our local restaurants. And now he is back at school, so I am on my own. So I think your idea is a good one and that I should do it because I really, well, I, let me just say I don't cook. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank you. Do, but tell me one thing. Will I enjoy being on the meal plan? Some nights. <laughs> An, honest most, most nights. Yeah, yeah. An honest answer. An honest answer. OK. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We have another question. Hi, um, I'm Jennifer Talley, Hi, and I'm Jennifer. starting my fifth year uh, in the graduate program in the biology department. And when I was interviewing here five years ago, uh, to use your words, there was something about the quality of the university environment that I really liked at Case, and that was that pets were allowed on campus. And then the administration put forth a ban, not only on furry pets, but also on, say, personal fish tanks. <laughs> And do you have any thoughts about your administration maybe repealing that incredibly unpopular ban? <laughs> One thing I need to know is, is how that squares with what I saw when I was here for move-in day. So I came for move-in day and a student was there with a pet rat. No, seriously. And I was told this was allowed. So rats are allowed, but fish tanks are not? Is that, do I have that right? So as I understand it, in faculty offices and other university buildings with classrooms, pets are no longer allowed of any kind. OK, but in the residence halls, they are. Yes. And, and at the time this ban was put into place, there were 11 dogs coming into just the biology department. And this made a lot of faculty and students incredibly unhappy. <laughs> well, I, I will have to look into that, because I, I really was puzzled by the question, since I knew that we did have pets in the, at least some pets in the residence halls. Right. And I recall, I was a little surprised to see the rat moving in that day, but, uh, but <laughs> was told that these kind of pets were actually allowed. And I think somebody said that fish were allowed in the residence halls. Is that right? OK, so I, I really thought the premise of the question was wrong because I didn't understand that there was a different rule for non-residence buildings. So I need, to, I need to look into that. OK, thank you. OK, I promise I will. <laughs> I'm not anti-pet. <laughs> we had fish, guinea pigs, cats, the whole, you know, the, whole, the whole range of kid pets over the years. As long as the rat isn't enrolling in Engineering 145. I, think I don't okay. think so. <laughs> have another question? Hi, um, I'm Rachel Stone King. I'm a senior and I've been a member of the varsity track and field team for my first three years. Um, my question is, uh, what are your overall thoughts regarding the concerns brought forth by the athletic teams regarding the athletic department? Yeah, I, the athletic program reports to student affairs which reports to the provost and I have talked with the provost about looking into those concerns and I think that is in process. It's a fair question. Okay. So I can't be more specific until they've had a chance to really you know, look into it seriously. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Hi, I'm Shelly Gosen. I'm a junior and I'm uh, accounting and French major. And you already mentioned that you have plans f to address our dropping rank in the US, US News and World Report. But um, do you know if there's anything that's going to be done concerning <coughs> our rising rank as uh, one of the campuses with the least happiest students, or our second largest workload, second only to MIT, and maybe those are related? <laughs> I met with all the directors in student affairs this morning, and we did talk a lot about the student experience and how important that is. And it really, we, we have to consider it from, from a really integrated experience. You can't separate sort of student life things, extracurricular activities from the academic experience, and your question suggests exactly that. So we are looking at, at how we can make the student experience even better. I don't want to shy away from academic rigor because I think many of you chose this place because you were seeking that and you knew that you would find it here. But I also agree that, that we have to look seriously at the whole experience for our students and really be willing to take a look at the good and the bad. And I think we are willing to do that, and this is a good time to start doing it. 
uh, if, it, if it hasn't really started already. And I think some work has already been done in that area. But it really has to be a collaboration of faculty and administrators from the academic side as well as the people who are involved in, in student life because all of that is part of your everyday experience. And that all needs to be, all of that wisdom needs to be brought to bear on, on the issue that you're raising. I would like to see our students feel good about their experience here because, of course, happy students are happy alumni, and we all know that happy <laughs> alumni are really important. And it does truly start while you're here as students. And I, I get a little bit of a skewed sample in the sense that I tend to talk to a lot of students who probably disproportionately are happy here and they've chosen to get really involved and, and are having a good experience and have opportunities to work closely with faculty and feel good about all of that. But I recognize that we, we have to meet the needs of all of our students and that, that I can't rely on just the people I happen to talk with that we have to hear from all of you. So I think that's a really good question. I did literally just meet with the directors of student affairs this morning and we talked about exactly that. Fantastic, so thank We'll you. have to come back to you with more on that. All right, thank you. Thank you. You have another question? Hi, I'm uh, Xantha Gray. I'm a first year master's student in the biology program. And I'm also proud to say that I did five years of undergraduate here. So I'm entering my sixth year in case and I've fully spent a quarter of my life living here. <laughs> um, my question is this, in the past four years, the university has been really fond of displaying what it calls its educational power with uh, extravagant technology. Uh, and my example is there's 52 inch flat screens in almost every building on campus. There's six or seven 24 hour computer labs all over campus which go mostly unused. Um, in light of our situation with debt, are you going to continue this level of technological extravagance? Well, I don't know whether it should be considered technological extravagance, but I do think we always have to assess whether the things that we're providing are actually important to all of you. And so computer labs, for example, which were very important for a number of years, might be less important as more and more students tend to have computers in their rooms, laptops that they take with them to class. Um, I do think, though, that we will always maintain some computer labs as a backup. So when your computer crashes, and you've got that paper due and you are desperate to get it done, you have a place to go on campus to be able to do that work. So I think I we will always true. have that. I also am sure that, that there will always be some among us who will not either choose to or not be able to afford to buy a personal computer and therefore will want to have access to our computer labs. But we do need to assess how much those are being used and decide how much to continue to spend on those. Um, with regard to the flat screen TVs, uh, you know, I, 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 there, was, there was some kind of flat screen TV in the lobby of the building where I live, Building 4, in the Village at 115. That's the only one I've seen. Uh, <laughs> if, if we have one uh, in a Delbert Hall, I haven't seen it. Definitely not in my office or anywhere I've been there. Uh, so so the, perhaps that's not a place where one would normally be put. But I also think we have to do a good job in assessing the impact of the investments we make, whether it's in technology or anything else, because we want to get the most bang for the buck. And we want to do what is going to serve our students, our faculty, and our staff, and allow them to do their work uh, in the best possible way. And if those aren't good expenditures, then we need to step back and look at what really would matter. And so I, I just simply don't know enough about flat screen TVs and don't have enough information on the use of computer labs, although I do know that nationally we see some decline in that as a result of more and more students having their own technology. It's also like phones, uh, landlines in dorm rooms used to be very important and now so many of our students come with cell phones, it's really changed. And so we, we just have to continue to reassess and regroup. Thank you. Hi, President Snyder. Hi, Bruce. How are you? <laughs> Uh, well, I do a lot with student activities, so I'm kind of yes, curious know. to know. <laughs> I'm kind of curious to know. Um, you've been involved with higher education for quite a long time. It's almost safe to say you never really graduated. <laughs> so, out of all the time that you spent in college, what are what was your favorite student-produced event that you were attended? 
Uh, I have been at some really amazing student-produced events, and I hope that my best one will be here, and maybe this will be the one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I really have been at some incredible student-led events over I mean, 19 years at Ohio State and five years before that. Although when I was here those five years, the only student events I attended really were at the law school. And there were some great ones. So I now am obviously much more broadly involved. Um, for me, the best things have always been the, the student service projects because I think those made the greatest difference. But I also saw a great example of, of students really being able to have an impact by getting involved in politics in the city, uh, in Columbus, where I was before. Lighting in the neighborhoods around the campus was a very big issue. And our student leaders really got involved and got a $900,000 grant from the city, uh, something that we'd been trying to push for a long time. But when students spoke, uh, officials listened, elected officials listened. So I was really impressed with the way that they worked with us, but also were willing to step out on their own and, and take the lead on that. So a, a terribly impressive outcome. Uh, but so many fun events, gosh, that, they used to have a dance marathon I always thought was fun, although it was overnight and I don't really do two or three in the morning all that well. <laughs> so let's make our special event here something that's not at two or three in the morning. But, but it, it, when you ask me that in a few years, it'll be something here, I'm sure. Well, I have a follow-up to that, if you don't mind. Uh, one of, of my favorite events here is uh, Spring Fest. And as part of... As part of Spring Fest, there's uh, a pretty big concert that we like to get student feedback on as to which band they would like. So President Sander, which band would you like to see at Spring <laughs> oh. Fest this year? You are asking the wrong person because, of course, my always answer will be Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Which, of course, dates me. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel actually came to Ohio State's campus a few years ago, and I always was involved in recruiting students. And they finally told me, stop mentioning that. <laughs> students don't care about Simon and Garfunkel. You have to mention groups like The Strokes. So I didn't even know what The Strokes <laughs> as a band, I didn't even know uh, who, who they were. I'd never heard them. But I have to get in tune with the music of a different generation, so I'm working on it. My children are helping me with that. You can help me too. So okay. what band do you think we should have? I don't know, Simon. I'm a Simon and Garfunkel oh, fan Oh, well, great. So. You've got so an we can, old we can, soul, Maybe Bruce. we can work something out. <laughs> Thank you, President Senator. Well, let's see if we can get them here. I would love that. <laughs> I'll have to admit my guilt on Simon and Garfunkel also. See, we've got a Simon and Garfunkel fan club right here. <laughs> Another question? Um, hello, my name is Ashley Lowry and I'm a senior mathematics major. Um, my question is, with the rising size of the incoming undergraduate first year classes, um, do you see Case being le less selective these past few years? I think we have to take a look at, at our, what we really want to do as a university and, and what is the optimal size for our undergraduate class. You may know that we just hired a new vice president for enrollment. He just started, I think, right after Labor Day. We had his welcome reception earlier this afternoon. And we are asking him to help us look at the issues of size and quality and effective recruitment. And we hope that all of you will be engaged with this because one of the things that he will tell you is the very best recruiters are our current students because students want to hear from you. And next to you, our very best recruiters are faculty because prospective students want to hear from the people who will be standing in front of those classrooms. So I think we need to have a real strategic plan and look at the relationship of size to what we can do on the campus, our capacity, both in terms of faculty, in terms of housing, and in terms of the complete student experience, as well as quality that you mentioned. And I don't have an answer for that, but, but Randy Dykey, who's our new vice president for enrollment, is already hard at work on that. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Petrick. I'm a junior economics major. I've got a two-parter. First one's a softball, second one's pretty tough. First of all, what's your favorite color? Uh, What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate chip. Okay. And who would win, a, win in a fight? CFO Hussein Sadid or VP Dick Jameson? <laughs> I, I refuse to answer that <laughs> on the grounds that it could incriminate me with my colleagues. So Fair enough. <laughs> they're both great. Who do you think would win? Oh. I, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. That would be an epic, epic contest. I was, I was just wondering how I need to hedge my bets. 
Hi, um, I'm Natasha Dolgen, and I'm a third year international studies major, and I'm the president of the Student Global AIDS Campaign and the vice president of the American Medical Student Association. So you might be prepared for maybe a harder question here. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, we were in the Inamori Center yesterday with Dr. Eastwood, um, me and the College Scholars Program, and we were talking about like leadership on an international level, you know, on a national level here in Cleveland and then on campus. And I was wondering what you think of the role of the institution in general, the role of the university in general, and of Case Western in the AIDS epidemic, both locally in Cleveland and nationally, and uh, internationally. We are involved in that in a variety of ways. I think our, our health sciences school, particularly the School of Medicine, of course, is involved in research, and that's critically important um, in, in combating this thing. Also in education, and we have been working globally as well. We have, a, have projects going in Africa, which I think are very important, also being led by the School of Medicine, and some of our students have been involved in that as well. Um, so I think we have lots of opportunities, and some of our student service projects have been engaged with that very issue. So I think we have lots to contribute to that, uh, because we are a comprehensive research university with students who are very engaged with, with the issues that matter the most to our community and to our world. So I think that's a great example of one, but it is one among others, too, that I think are important. Thank you. So I think we have time for just a few more questions. Hi, uh, hi my name is David Gasser, and I'm a senior political science major. Um, I remember last year during the presidential search that there was a lot of concern of, you know, with some of the recent problems the university had, we wouldn't attract a good uh, quality candidates. Um, I just want to well, say I'm that we. Well, I'm not sure where you're going with no, that. I just, and, I, and I just wanted to say that I think we were all very much relieved when we uh, heard that you were selected. And I also wanted to say that. Um, when you mentioned that you uh, saw campus morale here was um, higher than you had maybe anticipated, I just wanted to say that you know I think it's a lot due to the way you've handled these first initial few months and commend you on that. Um, my question is, what made you decide to leave your good position at a well-respected university and come to a university that has had you know a few problems in the past few years? I really felt a special connection here. So when I was thinking about this position, it wasn't just another job at a place where I had never been. I had been here, and I had my first faculty job here. So maybe there's something special about the place where you do have your start in that way. And that was a special pull for me. Um, and I really, did, I really did feel a sense of community here. Uh, in, a, in a very important way, and I think that helped draw, draw me back. I loved being a part of University Circle, as I mentioned. I loved being a part of Cleveland. We do have challenges. Perhaps our challenges are somewhat more publicly known because of the kind of challenges we've had, but every institution has a lot of challenges. And of course, you never know, taking any of these jobs, what's going to happen uh, the next day. And I think I've had a few of those surprises here, and we don't know what's going to come tomorrow as well. So I think you just have to be committed to the place and the people, most importantly. And for me, I felt that sense of connection. And was re really, it was just an amazing opportunity. Yes, challenges, we have plenty of those. But those, are, those truly are opportunities. And I think I saw a place that has tremendous potential that really does have the opportunity to be among the world's top research, urban research universities and has something special to contribute. At the same time, because we are still relatively small, we're able to preserve that special sense of community that I think is so important and that I hope our students walk away with and keep for the rest of their lives. So preserving that and enhancing that, as well as enhancing the university's academic stature, and those are the things that matter a lot to me. And it was a great opportunity to come and do them at a place where I had been before and that I felt a special connection. Hello, my name is Doug Bentley, and I'm a senior biology major. And this doesn't have a lot to do with me, because I'm graduating very soon. But in the past two years, we saw a lot of people leave. Obviously, the president, we've now seen Provost Anderson leave. And along that time, four of the five deans also left as well. And a lot of those have been replaced. The provost, I believe, has been replaced. But do you see this now as entering a time of stability for Case? I mean, is the, are we now in the point where we can actually move on without changes? I mean, I know the academic field is always changing, and especially the upper echelons of universities, but where do you see CASE as like a stable entity in the next few years? 
I think part of our challenge is to make sure that there is stability at the same time that we're moving forward. And I think part of that has to do with creating a real feeling of trust because that upheaval has created a sense of unrest and that does cause a lack of trust. And that's not a good thing in any organization and certainly not on a university campus. So I think we are entering a, a period of, of, I hope, both great stability and tremendous positive change uh, that you will look back in a few years and feel really good about, about where we've gone. Uh, obviously, I, you know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, but I will tell you that one of my colleagues at the law school, which was, I, I visited all the schools in the first few weeks that I was here, and one of my colleagues at the law school, who was not somebody I had ever met before, wasn't here when I, when I came, the, when I was here the last time, came since then, uh, prefaced a question with when I was halfway through my presidency and had been here 10 years. <laughs> so I thought that was a very optimistic uh, way of looking at it. Whether I will last 20 years or not, you know, who, who can say, but I don't like to move. I was 19 years at Ohio State. I just moved. I just unpacked. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> as, as a follow-up, though, you were a provost at a past university. How did it feel to come to a university that just now has lost their provost? Do you feel a little bit empty, a little bit without some help? Well, I knew, of course, I knew Provost Anderson because we had been provosts together. Uh, but I felt very fortunate that we were able to, to get Jerry Goldberg, as I mentioned, longtime dean of the School of Dental Medicine and a very successful dean to step into that role here because he has a great history with this university and with the School of Dental Medicine and he's a great leader. So I'm excited about working with him and we're already having a great time. Yes, of course, we have challenges every day, but we, we also feel like we're making a lot of progress and I think that's important. And he's just a tremendous colleague and a great leader. I'm happy to be working with him. Thank you. Yeah, I would, I would say in, in my experiences with, with Dr. Goldberg, he truly is an exceptional leader from a student's perspective. One more question. Hi, my name is Tran and I'm a fifth year anthropology and art history major here. I'm the current general manager at WRUW and one of our biggest concern is the lack of space in our home which is the basement of Mather Memorial and there were some were you know some news of like a new student center that's been going around for the past 25, 30 years, because we've had staff members <laughs> who've said that we've been promised ample space in this new student center. And I was wondering how, how, real, of, how real of a promise that this will be. We are working on plans for a new university center, which will be a great space for students and will include space for a number of student organizations. I can't tell you today exactly when we will build it, but we will build it and we will tell you, I hope sometime later this year, some kind of timeline for that project. And we do obviously want students to be involved in helping us shape that project, so you will be hearing more about that. But you're right, that has been talked about for a number of years here, and I'm only coming on to this yeah. rather late in the, in the discussion. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure, but thank you. I'm feeling no <laughs> pressure whatsoever. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, again, I, I want to thank all the students for coming. Um, and especially, I want to thank you, President Snyder. I, from a, a previous student said that the morale here is higher than what you had expected. And I do think it is because of all these signs of good faith that you have shown since you've been here, coming to events like this, to the Indians game, braving the, braving the weather uh, last Friday. So I, I think that's a, that's a tremendous sign of good faith. And I think the students particularly have higher morale than, than what you'd expected because of all these things that you do. So I, I think we should um, give her a round of applause for being here tonight.